Hi everyone, thank you for coming. Um, uh, so as Trisha mentioned, I'm talking about energy efficient housing for the gear areas today, and this is my Fulbright Research Fellowship. Um, so I'm gonna give you a uh, general context for why this research project is happening, uh, give you a background of how the research was conducted, um, what the final design is, and what the price point and all the building science research that was also done in addition to the design. So we all know that global warming is uh, an existing phenomenon and that uh, it is produced by a lot of CO2 production that is uh, basically creating a greenhouse effect where um, it's basically overheating the planet because there's too much CO2 in the atmosphere. And so um, that ends up affecting the water cycles of the planet, um, which is what's causing, you know, extreme storm conditions or, um, you know, uh, extreme droughts and uh, a, a big fluctuation weather patterns in comparison to what we're normally used to seeing and predicting. Um, so currently, you know, we're all trying to work towards um, making sure that the world doesn't increase in temperature by two degrees Celsius. And I think very often most people don't understand what that actually means. Um, and uh, the reason why it's really important to note this is that it's basically going to uh, increase all of the extreme weather conditions that we're already seeing, uh, whether it's an increase of uh, zuds in Mongolia or an increase of, um, uh, you know, hurricanes or um, uh, droughts in other areas, uh, which then leads to sometimes, for example, in California, to big forest fires, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it basically creates a, a huge strain on the human population. Um, and one thing that's also really important to understand, too, is that buildings actually contribute to 40% of the CO2 production. Um, so it's actually something that where, you know, if you design a building sustainably, you can actually have a huge impact on the global climate because um, you are no longer using fossil fuels, because um, you're designing your building assemblies efficiently, and um, it can really help to reduce all the strains that we're currently um, uh, creating on the environment. So a little bit about my background. I have a Bachelor's of Architecture and a Bachelor's of Fine Arts from the Rhode Island School of Design. Um, one thing I really want to note about that education is that when I was there, I was the student team leader of a project where we built a passive textile house, which is what eventually led me to Mongolia. So a passive house is a house that uses 90% less energy than your average home. And essentially what we did is we built it out of textiles because we knew that the materials already existed on the construction market and we wanted to apply it to um, you know, existing uh, contemporary homes in the building industry because we knew it was possible. Um, and so this kind of uh, instigated my passion for textiles and architecture and energy efficiency. Um, after that, I worked in a research and development for building materials for two years, where I developed a much more technical understanding of building science, you know, uh, patents, like what the challenges are currently in the building industry, and, um, uh, and why things, for example, are so slow to move on the American market in comparison to the U European market because of different financial strains or different social pressures in terms of energy and resources. So uh, that eventually led me to apply for the Fulbright in Mongolia. And um, just to give you guys a little background about the Fulbright in case any of you don't know, uh, the Fulbright is really about mutual understanding. So um, it's really about e uh, exchanging ideas and developing partnerships and relationships with the communities that you, uh, or the countries that you go to work with uh, um, depending on your application. And so I really um, 
you know, sought to be invested in a lot of different areas, whether it was with GearHub, that um, was my, one of my first partners here, uh, that develops prototypes for the Gear areas for energy efficiency. I'm teaching sustainable design at the Institute of Engineering and Technology, and those, that curriculum I'm now using to teach at other both professional architectural and construction organizations too. Um, and then uh, Saint-Gobain, which is my old employer, also decided to provide me additional um, uh, technical building science support for my project. And then Ecotown is the uh, GARE district community that we're working with in order to apply this um, energy efficient GARE, but also it's the community that I've been working with in order to better understand the GARE areas on a one-to-one -one, uh, personal basis. So we all know that uh, in the winter time, Ulaanbaatar is the most polluted city in the world. And 80%, um, according to the Zorg Foundation, uh, of this pollution is due to the GARE areas. And it's really, really important to note that currently, actually more pollution is being produced because of bastions, uh, which are um, hard, uh, more uh, uh, traditional houses, um, versus GARES, which you know, is the traditional Mongolian um, uh, uh, nomad housing system. Um, and the reason for this is, is that bastions are not uh, built properly with proper insulation. They're not airtight. There's not a proper ventilation system. There's not all the proper air barrier, vapor barrier, different uh, essential materials in order to make the entire assembly uh, functional and weather well over a hundred year long period of time. Um, and so the problem is, is that both the gares and the bastions are using coal to, to heat their homes. And because the bastions are now bigger than gares, um, because families want bigger homes and more space and more privacy and a variety of other reasons, um, uh, they're actually burning more coal to heat their homes than uh, uh, like a normal standardized five Han gare is, for example. And so the problem is, is that the pollution that's created from these coal burning stove, as you all probably know, uh, you know, produces lung cancer. It can create strokes because you're now uh, severely deficient in uh, oxygen and also now have other particulate matter, which can just uh, get in the way of your natural brain function. <laughs> and then it can also cause uh, heart disease as well. And this is produced um, uh, because of PM 2.5 and PM 10 uh, particulate matter, which PM 2.5 is the most dangerous one because it can get into your blood system. It basically gets further into your body, whereas uh, PM 10 um, kind of uh, uh, ha has a harder time getting into the uh, more granular aspects of your uh, anatomy. So um, I wrote my Fulbright project with the goal of trying to create an energy efficient gear. And because I had this previous uh, experience of developing a passive textile house, I wanted to see if it was possible to build a passive gear. Uh, so gear, as you all probably know, is made primarily out of textiles, which makes it such an efficient housing system for nomads um, 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 on the step. And uh, the idea was then to adapt housing systems in the GARE area so that they could be 90% more energy efficient and reduce the overall coal consumption of homes. Um, so we currently have a wide variety of partners. It's really important to address that because it's not just me um, in this game. Um, you know, the Institute of Engineering and Technology, I've been teaching there and it's been really, really interesting because students have been coming up with their own passive gear concepts. Uh, the U.S. Embassy, we had a grant, they supported uh, Ecotown uh, for the building of our, our prototype. Zag Construction has been a consultant. UBGC, we consulted with them because we wanted to make uh, potentially use solar panel systems as an alternative energy source. Um, uh, Eric Bank is paying for our alternative heating system as well as um, our alternative uh, water heating supply system. Um, we're uh, also working with a lot of uh, other local construction companies to, desire the, to design um, and construct the interior finishes and develop a drawing set that's in Mongolian so that the project is something that can be reproduced. Um, and we also have, GearHub has um, source partners such as UPenn and Stanford to um, uh, build off of uh, uh, 
um, some of the uh, data that I've, I've begun collecting from the GARE areas uh, and also installed additional equipment such as air quality monitors and weather stations, which is really important to get an overall uh, qualitative assessment. And then uh, we've also been working with the Mongolian University of Science and Technology in order to use their um, research lab to develop alternative insulation systems to reduce the cost of the project. So um, to give you guys a general understanding of our target market, so today there's over 216,000 households in the GARE areas, um, which means that it's more than two thirds of uh, uh, UB's population. And 48% uh, of those households are in GARES, and um, the other half are, or the other percentage are in Bashans. And so that's really what our target market is. Um, most of those households really want to move into modern homes with proper amenities. They want proper plumbing. They're all sick of burning coal. You know, they want privacy. Um, they all have more or less the same aspirations that we do for our own homes. Um, and um, it's also uh, important to note that their average income is around 900, 922,000 MNT per month. Um, so what we're really doing in this project is we're trying to gear towards low-income families. And while, um, you know, I did a lot of research when I first arrived in order to understand different initiatives that, um, you know, GIZ or ADB and um, other very large-scale organizations and other small-scale organizations are doing to develop either um, energy-efficient bastions or big, large-scale apartment complexes. The idea is that this is an in-between solution. Um, you know, to build a giant apartment complex, that will take a lot of time. Um, this can at least start to treat um, a certain target market that hasn't yet been addressed. We're not promising this to solve all the problems of air pollution. It's just about addressing one piece of the market, which is what's really important to understand. Um, uh, the idea is that also is in all of the research and development that's gone into this project is that all the material application and all the material research and all the building science research that we've done, the idea is that that can also apply to a bastion too. Um, uh, and I'll explain to you why later on. So what we're aiming for is that uh, the Mongolian Green Finance Corporation recently uh, established this initiative where they're um, uh, going to subsidize mortgage loans for homes that are geared towards energy efficient, low income uh, family uh, housing systems. So what that means is that if that home uh, whether it's a GER or a Bashan, produces less than 252 kilowatts per meter square per year, that is qualified as an energy efficient home. In addition to that, if that home is less than 600,000 MNT per meter square per year, uh, sorry, 600,000 MNT per meter square, that also means that it's now in, an, in a lower income bracket, which makes it more affordable. And so, We've developed this design in order to meet that requirement. And so the reason why I use the home, the word home strategically is because I qualify a GER as well as a Bashan as a valid home. The question is, is just about how you go about applying the building material strategically. Um, and so what's really advantageous is that tr currently what's happening is that many families are taking on mortgage loans to sometimes build their own bastions or you know build uh, maybe a more standardized system that's already on the market and the interest rate is around 22 to 25 percent which is huge in the u.s the interest rate on a mortgage loan is four percent so this is unheard of um, and the, what's happening with the Mongol, Mongolian Green Finance Corporation is because they have this standard, once you meet this standard, your interest rate is now reduced to 8% because it's subsidized by the, by the Green Climate Fund. Uh, and so that's actually very, very helpful for families who are you know, uh, engaging in this investment. So what I did when I first arrived is that in November with Gear Hub, um, I installed um, this sensor package equipment that Saint Gobain uh, uh, provided me, which enabled, enables me to have a basic general understanding of how Gear is currently performing. Um, I installed it in uh, uh, Ecotown's uh, Gare district area, which is a, com a community collaborative of 300 families that have all agreed to improve their environment and you know, be involved in different initiatives, whether it's like trash collection 
or planting trees or building other sustainable uh, uh, energy efficient housing systems such as an earth ship um, um, to improve their all overall environment. Um, so I installed the equipment in four or five Han gears um, in order to have a baseline assessment of how gear is currently performing. How much coal is it burning? Um, you know, what are the heat fluctuations in that space? Uh, what's the R value or the U value, uh, depending on which country you're in? Um, R value is basically the resistance, uh, the thermal resistance that that wall has, and basically is about how much heat that wall is able to retain. Um, and so um, while, uh, in addition to that, what I also did is throughout November and December, I also lived with three different uh, families in the gear areas uh, and uh, in order to have a better understanding of the living practices. So, you know, what are the struggles that they deal with in terms of collecting water? Um, you know, um, how hard is it to bag coal? Um, uh, you know, all these different things that I was eager to understand before going about the design so I could really adapt the design to the, the challenges that families are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. In addition to that, I also interviewed in the daytime 18 different families in that area in order to have a better understanding of what their living aspirations are as well as what their current situation, living situation is. So meaning financially, you know, what's their utilities bill? What are their like grocery costs? Um, uh, what are their living aspirations? Like do they prefer gear or bashing? Why do they like one over the other? Um, et cetera, et cetera. And so, um, it was really, really interesting because I started to have a better picture of what was actually happening. You know, I read a lot of reports before living in the gear areas about what the general statistics were, um, but really interviewing families on one-on-one -on -one basis was, I think, personally more valuable uh, because I was able to kind of start to realize more questions that I needed to ask in order to have a better understanding of how to develop this design to make it uh, really helpful for people. Um, so I, uh, you know, I understood that the average income was about uh, 1 million MNT. Um, and obviously a lot of, well, what became obvious to me was that uh, a lot of jobs are seasonal too. So in the winter time when prices go up because families have to spend more on coal and um, have more financial uh, strains, that's actually when they're also um, the least able to fund um, or you know, pay for those uh, strains, which is um, obviously a huge challenge. I also had a better understanding of what their utilities bill is. So the average was about 20,000 MNT per family in terms of what they're paying for their electrical uh, bill. And a lot of families are currently splitting their electrical lines um, and they have a meter on top too. And so that's really important to understand because one of the things that we were thinking about initially was, you know, using solar panel systems and, um, uh, you know, if, if a family's only used to currently paying 20,000 MNT uh, per month, uh, on their utilities bill, like, you know, if we propose, for example, an electrical heating system um, and it's now 130,000 MNT, that's completely outside what's financially, like, feasible for them to pay for on a, day to, on a monthly basis. Um, so what we're really aiming for is for something that's feasible on the long term. The other thing, uh, one of the other questions that we asked them too is like how, how much coal are they using on a day-to-day -day basis or on, uh, throughout the winter season? Um, so what we found is that families are actually buying, some families are buying tons of trucks, tons of coal through like trucks basically delivering that coal to their hasha, which is their uh, fenced in site. Um, and uh, some families are buying a portion of it because they don't have enough money saved and then are buying smaller bags of coal, which ends up being more expensive on the long term, but because they don't have the cash immediately, that's the only way that they can go about paying for it. Um, so what's really interesting is that you learn that, you know, families in an individual home, some families will ben burn as much as eight tons of coal. And so now if you think about how the fact that there's like 216,000 households in the gear areas and they're, let's say that they're all burning eight tons of coal each, now you understand why this air pollution problem is happening. So um, we also asked families uh, what their 
medical costs were and what their grocery costs were. Because one of the things that we were trying to anticipate was if we're building this energy efficient home where families are no longer burning coal on the inside, will they be able to save costs in terms of uh, medically uh, because they're no longer exposed to as much um, like coal production on the interior? Um, another question that we had was what their, what, what their monthly grocery costs were because we also wanted to make sure that, you know, if the average income is 1 million MNT and we're asking them to spend, you know, 40% of their income on this new mortgage loan, like, will it really be accessible in regards to what they're actually, what they need to be spending to support their families and to support, like, feeding them? Um, and then we also asked families, you know, what their current uh, loan situation was. So that was also something that I learned about when I first arrived here is that uh, there are uh, a lot of loans. Um, and uh, I was really surprised actually to find that 13 out of 18 families currently have loans. And so eight out of 13 have loans from a formal bank, three out of 13 have loans from relatives, and two out of 13 have loans from non-formal uh, non uh, financial institutions. And um, what we also did is we asked them how they felt about living in a GARE um, and why they liked living in the GARE areas. So some said that, you know, it was a lot freer. They liked it because you could park your car, uh, their kids could run around. Um, they didn't have neighbors living on top of them, which is as one of my favorite um, statements is that that's not something I never thought about, which is why they didn't like the idea of living in an apartment. Um, but, you know, they did say that the cons of living in a gear was that it was dirtier, it was harder to maintain, managing, a coal, managing coal was a pain, you know, kids could burn themselves on the stove, getting water is very difficult because of the water well system, and gears can smell bad um, because of not only, you know, the water damage to the felt, but also, you know, there's no privacy, so you can't divide the smell. <laughs> um, then uh, we also asked families, you know, what were their living aspirations? Like, did they prefer Bastions over Gares? And, you know, 17 out of 18 said that they did prefer Bastions over Gares. They said that they perceived Bastions to be warmer. They perceived them to be easier to heat. Uh, uh, and uh, we only, out of the 18 families we interviewed, we interviewed two that were in Bastions. Um, and it was interesting because everyone who lived in a Gare perceived a Gare to be easier, or uh, perceived a Bastion to be easier to heat. Um, and uh, they said that um, a lot of people said it was more comfortable, more spacious, they thought it was cleaner, uh, and they thought that you would only have to heat a bastion once a day, which I thought was really interesting, because the bastions that we visited were still heating their homes with coal. Um, and that's obviously not necessarily every bastion, but it just means to say, like, the point is, is that, like, just heating it with coal maybe is not, well, whatever, there's a lot of technicalities in that. So there's also cons living in a Bastion. Um, some people felt that it was like a four-walled box. Um, some people also recognized that there was mold growth. Um, there wasn't a proper ventilation system. Um, often families don't build an actual bathroom, proper plumbing system on the uh, inside the Bastion because they're trying to cut costs. They don't realize um, as they're building the Bastion that it's uh, uh, costing them a lot more money than they anticipated, and so they end up just not building the bathroom to cut costs. Um, there's also smells that come from the toilet um, if it's not built properly. Uh, uh, foundations often don't have reinforcement because families don't want to use rebar uh, because it's expensive, um, which is actually really, really dangerous because UB is in a seismic zone, which means it's an earthquake zone. So the day that there's an earthquake here, um, there will be a lot of major challenges. Um, so from all of these interviews, we took away some key design points to address all of the concerns that families had and try and take, you know, uh, the Mongolian gear and adapt it to what it, what families would like it to be to not only reduce air pollution, but also meet their housing aspirations as well as uh, their, uh, what's feasibly uh, realistic for them in terms of their income. So the idea was to make it energy efficient, to reduce their uh, energy costs, uh, to have proper uh, ventilation and air filtration systems, to have a proper efficient plumbing system, uh, to have a proper foundation and structural system, to make it fast to build and, and do it yourself because we're not anticipating with this design that it's going to be some big construction company doing this. It's supposed to be easy and accessible for everyone to reproduce. 
And then um, um, the idea is that we are no longer using coal burning stoves. One of the things that we did ask families was that, you know, would you be okay if you were no longer using a stove inside your home? And I believe 16 out of 18 said yes. So um, the idea is to just use an electrical uh, 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 stove plate uh, instead. And then uh, the idea also was to use passive house design strategies to, to make it more energy efficient. Um, so, so there's a lot of passive design systems and then there's the passive house standard. Um, so passive house design, passive design systems basically is where you orient your home towards the south, you make it very insulated, you can have um, a strategic solar gain uh, systems, uh, which are passive. Um, you have also uh, solar shading systems, a lot of thermal mass to retain the heat, as well as uh, keep the heat from entering inside your home. Uh, you have proper ventilation, room arrangement, daylighting, and then you can use kind of fancier phase change materials and other things, but we're not applying them in this project. Um, so the general concept behind the design is that we're taking the traditional five Han gear, which is the most common used gear currently, and we're removing the inefficient energy source, which is the coal burning stove. And we're also removing the inefficient daylight and ventilation store source, which is the ton. And we're integrating now a triple glazing window system so that it's much more energy efficient. And we're integrating a clean energy source so there's no more coal that's being burnt. And we're also adding a lot of thermal mass. So that's like a general overview. And so as I developed the designs, what I did is that I first started out with three passive gears and four passive bastions. And I took those designs and I went back to the families that I had initially met with, those 18 different families, uh, not all of them, but a, a handful. And I asked them which one they preferred and why. So based on that feedback, people told me, you know, I don't like where the bathroom is placed. I feel like it's dirty to have the bathroom indoors or, you know, um, because of, you know, the cultural traditions around the gear, um, it's considered, uh, um, you know, disrespectful, um, you know, to not have the door facing south and facing east, uh, you know, that, that's, even though it's more energy efficient, we don't care, like, they can't be that way. Um, so that was really, really important. So I was kind of trying to test the boundaries of what was feasible and what was not. So from that feedback, I basically created um, a more, uh, um, one passive gear design and one passive bastion design. And then from that feedback, I um, then consulted different construction and um, uh, architectural con companies in order to get feedback from them on costs. So right away, we're like starting to cut down the design in terms of what's feasible, um, uh, what's more efficient uh, to construct, et cetera, et cetera. And then I elaborated them uh, to have a more detailed uh, design according to uh, material application and uh, again to understand what's more uh, what's actually accessible according to materials that are currently on the market etc cetera, etc cetera. so this is the final passive gear design the idea is that um, you have this uh, uh, you have a south facing window for solar gain and you still have a south facing door but now it's slightly moved to the right um, uh, because you want to maximize light entering into the space so the way the floor plan works is that um, i don't know this is okay cool all right so the way the floor plan works you have an entrance on the south side where you have like a mudroom area that basically blocks additional air, uh, uh, air leakages uh, from entering into the central space. And um, you, uh, the first door, entrance door is a vacuum sealed door in order to reduce, again, uh, air loss to the exterior. And uh, you have uh, a direct entry into the bathroom space. So there's a shower, a sink, a toilet, and then a one ton tank uh, uh, for um, how families are currently collecting water in the gear areas. And then there's a septic system that we're also, uh, a proper septic system that we're also planning on installing, which is something that we've been working on with a professor from MUST, 
um, that uses basically uh, bacteria to recycle all the human waste and be able to uh, basically filter all the uh, uh, wastewater so that it's 90% filtered so that all that water can go back into someone's garden if they want to. Um, then um, if you enter on the east side right here, this is a traditional gerdor that we're keeping. And what we've done is we basically elevated the interior gear um, so that it does a couple things. One, um, one of the feedbacks that we got was that families are really sick of all the maintenance that goes into the gear. Um, that's a lot of the reason why families are going towards bastions because they're sick of dealing with all, uh, all of those challenges. So the idea is that by slightly elevating the gear off the ground, you're now limiting the amount of access to dirt that that, that gear is getting. On top of that, because we're no longer use a coal burning stove, families don't have to um, clean the interior fabric as much um, and we're still working on which fabric we want whether it's more of a polymer which means it's more of a plastic based fabric or whether it's more of a standardized material that's found currently on the market that families can clean easily um, so what you have here is all the furniture except for the couch is uh, currently designed according to uh, standard furniture that families have in their homes so a fridge, washing machine, sink, uh, small electric stoves that families are currently using. And then this is an air-to-air -air heat, uh, heat pump system that um, a professor from Berkeley University, Kirk Smith, he's actually a Nobel Prize winner for um, uh, these stoves, these efficient stoves that he created in the past. Uh, but they basically tested this air-to-air -air heat pump system to see whether it was possible to use this as an alternative to coal. And what they found is that to run that air-to-air -air heat pump system in a traditional 5-hon gear, that means that it's not like well-insulated and airtight and all this other stuff, is that it's actually cheaper. So that means that in an efficient gear, we're hoping that it's even cheaper to pay the utilities bill for this efficient heating system. Um, what uh, you also see is a water barrel system. So how families are currently collecting water uh, as they go to water wells and then they fill up these barrels. And so they can use that to not only fill the one ton water tank, but also keep it as storage for the kitchen. Uh, then they have a freezer for the meat. And um, all this space below here is, um, you, families can actually use for storage. There's these small cupboard areas. There's a TV, little stools, a table, and then a couch that the family wants. Um, then you have these adjustable doors, essentially that act as a divider for the space. So one of the big criticisms that uh, families informed us of was that they were really sick and tired of not having privacy. Um, so, you know, that's, uh, but at the same time, families that lived in a bastion missed the fact of like being more communal and more connected with the family. So the idea of this adjustable door is that it allows for both. Um, you have a permanent bedroom space on the north side, which is how families are currently um, sleeping in their gears. Um, uh, but then, and then you, so this is like the traditional bed, the religious podium, depending on the family, and then a desk area too. So it's a quiet space for people to be able to work. Um, and then you can access the utilities clo closet here, which is where the air to air heat pump passes through as well as the uh, water heating system. Um, so what's also important to note is that, uh, you know, while this acts as a permanent bedroom space that can simultaneously be social if people choose to like slide open these doors, um, this space can also act as a secondary bedroom space as well. So you now have two bedrooms. And then on top of that, what we've done is now we're creating a loft area above this technical core, which means that you now have three bedroom spaces if you want. Um, so the way it looks in elevation, if you take a cross section of the design, and this is looking east uh, inside the gear, uh, you'll see that you still have uh, the tone because it still acts as a good uh, lighting source. And then you have a um, south facing window that's two meters wide and 1.5 meters tall. Um, there is a tr the traditional gear door in order to kind of maintain that um, like one of the traditions behind the gear is the reason why the door is so small is that it's a sign of respect, right, to bow down and enter um, before you enter someone's home. And then meanwhile, we have, you know, a fridge, washing machine, sink, and then heating system. And then the, these stairs that go up to the bedroom area. 
Um, and so we're keeping the Han because it actually acts as a practical system to be able to hang things on the wall. Um, it protects the interior fabric and we're keeping the Un because, uh, also because it acts as a practical system so families can hang their laundry to dry, they, you know, stick um, precious items behind the Un. Um, and then also because we're trying to uh, maximize the Han and the Un's actual structural properties. There is additional structural reinforcement that we're adding on the uh, internally. Um, and that's just because we're adding so much insulation now that um, you need that. You need that. Um, so this is what it looks like on the interior. So what we're trying to do is um, with the idea is that we're using a traditional six Han gear on the interior. So it's something that can be sourced easily in theory. We're not going to some fancy gear manufacturer uh, where it then ends up only being accessible to a selective few. The idea is that we're trying to repurpose, repurpose a standardized system that's already in production on the market, but just slightly change the design around it. Um, uh, and then we're doing, you know, a few tweaks to the interior to have, you know, hardwood floors um, and, you know, uh, a, a higher quality interior fabric so that it's easier to maintain. And by the way, this is a trick that people often do on the construction market where you take, you know, a shitty old apartment and you will add nice hardwood floors and you paint the walls white again and like they mark up the price 50% and people buy into it. Um, so it's, it's not like necessarily a new trick in the book, but we're also making more, it more energy efficient um, and just having a ni nicer quality of environment. So then, uh, just so you have a better understanding of the technical core, um, there's a pipe that will be going out to the exterior where the air to air heat pump will be extracting air. Um, and then there's also a, a, a solar water heating system um, that we'll be using. Um, then there's a shower, there's a toilet, and then we'll have a proper septic tank system. And then there's that vacuum sealed interior uh, space. Um, so this is where um, it's really critical to understand the material assembly. So what we've done here, and this is what I've taught my students at the Institute of Engineering and Technology, is properly applied all the existing building materials that, that people are currently using today on the construction market for bastions, so traditional homes, but now applying it to the gear um, uh, to make it energy efficient and now uh, reducing the maintenance challenges that families currently have. So for those of you who don't know, um, families currently have to take down their gears twice a year in the spring and the fall to air out the felt because it gets all this water damage um, and um, it prevents basically mold growth by exposing it to the sun. Um, and what we're doing is that with this design, you can obviously tell by the poured concrete that it's permanent. So yes, it's no longer uh, designed to be this like movable structure. Um, but what, what it is doing is that it's preventing families to have to deal with the maintenance problem, which I can guarantee you no one likes that as far as I've, I've interviewed, none of the families have said they enjoy that process. Uh, it's even caused a lot of strife in certain, uh, yeah, couples. <laughs> um, so the point is, is that we're now strategically applying the proper, uh, you know, weather barrier, uh, I'll show you, uh, weather barrier, air barrier, uh, thermal, uh, a thermal barrier, which is like the insulation and the vapor barrier. So just to give you a brief building science lesson, uh, the weather barrier um, is the blue here. So it protects against rain or snow and it's also UV resistant. So it lasts a very, very long time. So whether it's shingles or wood siding or whatever, um, that's what your weather barrier is. Um, your air barrier is what makes your building airtight. Uh, and it also uh, prevents air, uh, water condensation from entering into your insulation system, which is really important because it's how you reduce mold growth on the interior of your assembly. Then your uh, uh, thermal flow layer is your insulation layer. So whether it's EPS, XPS, rock wool, whatever you want it to be, um, that's what basically keeps all the heat in. And then you have your vapor barrier on the interior, which basically um, extracts any moisture that somehow penetrates into that assembly uh, because no one's perfect and often there are mistakes that happen. Um, and it basically extracts that moisture from the inside of that wall assembly and then uh, brings it to the interior and eventually evaporates. So it, it prevents mold growth from the interior of your wall. 
And this is a concept that I've been teaching to my students at the Institute of Engineering and Technology. So out of the 14 students that I'm teaching, 13 of them live in GARES. So to see the designs that they've come up with is really, really interesting because they all have very distinct views about what should or shouldn't happen. And um, it's also just been really nice to like see them understand the principles and like apply them easily, which is really great. So now I'll talk a little bit more about the energy efficiency of the design. So I worked with two different partners to do these calculations. So one was a local building science company called BuildTech. Um, and they basically calculated more, th more thoroughly in terms of what the coolest heating, uh, sorry, what the coolest day of the year is, which is basically what the highest heating day or heating load day is for your heating system, which is what you always want to design your heating system for. Um, and they, um, um, used this uh, basically German software to calculate, calculate the overall heat load of the system. And simultaneously, I worked with Sangobam, my old uh, uh, employer, and uh, their research and development team in the building science department to do the energy assessment of the building. So both the energy and the moisture challenges that would potentially happen in the building. So the energy, so the way they calculated their heating loads is that they basically calculated the um, extremities of the heating degree days, which is the orange line that you see above and below. And um, they calculated the average, which is the blue line that you see in the middle. And so um, if you look at the uh, uh, net average uh, of the heating requirement of the housing system, it's about 7,822 kilowatts per year. And if you look at the maximum, it's, set, it's 8,707 kilowatts per year. Um, so what that means is that um, if we go back to the Mongolian Green Finance Corporation's uh, requirements to meet their low-income housing uh, uh, mortgage package, that means that we have to be less consuming less than 250 kilowatts per meter square per year. So currently, if you're looking just at the av net average energy required, you're actually we're actually at 50, uh, 150, approximately 160 meters uh, kilowatts per meter square per year, which means that we're below the target, which means that we're exceeding the requirements, and that's not even including solar gain that we would be getting from the south window. Um, and if you look at the max, we're still only at 177, uh, which again means that we're meeting the requirements, which is really good news. In addition to that, they also cal calculated the solar gain that we'd be getting from the south facing window, uh, which is approximately 100, uh, what, sorry, 1,465 kilowatts per year. Um, and basically, just to give you the graph, is blurry, uh, but basically this is January and this is December, and you can see that we'd be get, getting a maximum of heating load in the summertime, but which is when you don't want it because it's obviously too hot, but that's where you just have a shutter system in order to prevent like that excess of heat. Um, and then what they also did, which is really, really important, and it's, this is actually something I want to emphasize, is that they also did a moisture uh, analysis. So often now people are talking about insulating buildings, but you need to be aware of the moisture problem also, because it's not a proper building if you're not managing moisture as well. And so they did a moisture assessment, which is really, really critical because they emphasized the fact that there needs to be a one inch gap between the air barrier and the weather barrier because there will naturally be condensation on the surface of the air barrier. And so you want to have an air gap because you need to have that moisture evaporate um, uh, in that air gap. Um, and so they basically verified that the design would work if there's a one inch air gap in that space. Um, and then budget, so this is very important. Um, so currently, for the building materials and the construction price alone, we're at uh, 30 million, uh, uh, 30.5 million MNT. Uh, plus the air-to-air -air heat pump system, we're at 31.097 uh, thousand MNT. So um, we're doing well. Uh, we're less. I think we're about six. 
the sorry, um, the requirements for the Mongolian Green Finance Corporation's uh, mortgage loan was that you need to be less than 900,000 MNT, and we're less than that. I know we're less than 700,000 MNT, but again, we're currently doing like a reassessment now that we know which materials we're applying, et cetera, et cetera. So I just don't want to promise that, but I'm saying that we're confident that we're in that range. Um, and so also I want to explain that, you know, we initially thought about using a photovoltaic system as an alternative system for the uh, energy source. Um, but we basically found out that it, the, to, to install a, photo, a photovoltaic system alone was about how much the house itself was going to cost. So it's really hard to justify as a realistic low income housing solution for now. And then this is actually the favorite part of my project. Um, we, um, as far as like the design aspect goes. So one, one of the things that we're trying to do in, in order to reduce cost is uh, develop an alternative insulation system. Uh, so as you all probably know, Mongolians drink a lot of milk and the idea is to use recycled milk cartons as, uh, uh, and, and basically package them together as offset bricks um, as an alternative insulation system. And so the idea is that currently we're, we're partnering with MUST and using their lab space and uh, testing, the, testing the, the insulation assembly that we've developed um, with the equipment that Sangobin has provided me um, and trying to see if we can get a substantial R value as an alternative insulation system for the project. Um, so we're still, testing is still going, ongoing, so I can't promise you anything today, but hopefully we'll um, get somewhere eventually. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to mention is that we're currently looking to, uh, you know, employ another research partner to begin developing the construction phase and then go on to develop this project further. Um, Gerhub is looking for an employee as well as Ecotown. Um, so if you guys are interested in continuing to work with us on this project, uh, feel free to email me. It's on the board, um, or screen. And um, we'd love to work with you guys. We've been having a lot of fun and uh, it's been a really interesting project to work on. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.